I feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000. Or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Well, welcome to the Friday edition of Open Line. I'm your Friday host uh, today, Colin Donovan, sitting in for uh, Jack uh, Williams, who's off today. And so I'm uh, hosting in talent. I don't know exactly what's the right way to phrase that, but that'll that'll do when all else fails. Um so you just heard those phone numbers. Let me reiterate the numbers at least. Uh, 1-833-288-EWTN. That's one 288 ewtn or 3986 uh, if you prefer that. And uh, outside North America, country code 1 plus 205-271-2985. Country code 1, 205-271-2985. Eight, five. So we're uh, getting on into the, uh, the last days of summer here during a, a week in which we celebrate the Feast of the Assumption and moving towards the uh, Feast of the Coronation of Our Lady to be celebrated next Wednesday, in which we celebrate uh, the uh, eternal glory, or at least the, the glory she receives from God for her cooperation in the Incarnation and in her own sanctification. And so, uh, in a special way, I think we can think today about the Church. Because Our Lady is the first disciple of her Son. She's also an image of the Church. Uh, But the Church is a mixture of good and evil. We've already known that. Christ is holy. The things of Christ are holy. That has not changed. The teaching of the Church, the sacrament of the Church, the communion and charity that we have with one another, in union with the Pope and the bishops, but although all the members of the church can reflect our fallen human nature and often enough do, and we've had remarkable, uh, we'd have to say very remarkable examples of that in recent days in hearing uh, first about the, um, uh, the case of uh, former Cardinal McCarrick and then most recently the Pennsylvania um, grand jury case and uh, the really... It's not quite that legally, but it is certainly morally the indictment of the church leadership and the, and the treatment of the sex abuse scandal by the hierarchy in the state of Pennsylvania. And we have no reason to believe that that is not the case elsewhere in the country, and I think most people are assuming that in any case. But it shouldn't disturb our faith. It shouldn't disturb our faith in God, our faith in the institution of the church uh, as a divine and human reality our faith in the sacraments and their power to save us because it's Christ who saves us through the sacraments, not the minister who who acts uh, in persona Christi for them. And it shouldn't disturb our communion with the Pope and the bishops as a sign in the world of the unity of faith, hope, and love that uh, Christ willed to leave the Church. And so we should not be moved from that point. We should not take scandal in the sense that we should say, Hey, I can. I am not no longer obliged to believe, to act, and so on as a Catholic because of bad example. Uh, if you want bad example, there's plenty of it in the world, but we should not move us from the truth. So it's something that we have to um, hold on tightly to. Well, let me take uh, the first email because this certainly concerns uh, the news of recent days as well. And that is, uh, Paula asks, I just read that the Vatican has changed the teaching on the death penalty. I've been against the death penalty for a long time for the reasons given by the Curia. My question is, for such a change, do all bishops have to be in agreement, or is this teaching from the Pope with the authority to be binding? I'm quite sure there will be some Catholics who disagree with this teaching. Thank you, Paula. Uh, First of all, there, there are two supreme magisteriums in the Church. Um, We could also talk about the magisterium of each bishop, but each bishop is responsible for his own diocese. He doesn't act 
infallibly he acts with authority. So he is a magisterium, and he acts out of that, and, and we must give the respect that is due to that authority. But in the case of the, of the Pope acting for the universal church or a uh, uh, ecumenical council, or even outside of an ecumenical council, such as pu- in the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we have the supreme magisterium of the Apostolic College together with the successor of St. Peter, and that has supreme authority, and we refer to it as a supreme magisterium, but the Pope acting by himself has such supreme authority. So this is an authoritative act of the Pope out of his office. And I think what a lot of people are struggling for is to, to understand it, and a lot of uh, different historical factors come into account. One of which is the fact that the Church has always upheld that the state had the right to put someone to death uh, as an act of justice in which you might think of the Old Testament teaching, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and also a life for a life. This is illustrated in the Old Testament in which life is paid for by life. But other sins as well, adultery, sodomy, and you can go down the things which the the Levitical Code and the other uh, revelation of the Old Covenant says should be taught, should be the death penalty. And I think this was uh, preparation for the gospel in which these things certainly would be understood as mortally sinful, death of the soul, but not necessarily as something the death penalty is to be carried out. So we have our Lord himself saying that the, in the case of the woman caught in adultery, let he who is through, without sin throw the first stone. So by itself, taken as itself, as a matter of justice, independent of other considerations, yes, you could say all of these things spoken of in the Old Testament, from capital crimes to even other crimes that receive capital punishment, that these represent grave abuses of, of our freedom and have grave complica- uh, co- problems, uh, causes in society. So think of adultery and the cause that that has within the family. So that's the lesson to be learned there in general. Now, the church in the early days did not practice that code at all because it understood that in the Roman Empire it was uh, an unjust situation, unjust structures. Christians did not undertake offices which executed capital punishment. Christians did not execute capital punishment either. Uh, as our Lord counseled the centurion, there were certain things that you could do. If you were in the army, you would defend yourself. If you were in war, you would defend yourself uh, with uh, proportionate force to the person aimed at you. And this remains as a moral principle, undergirding not only personal self-defense, but just war and the licit use of capital punishment as a just defense. But there are many, there are different elements to capital punishment, one of them is the, na- is the nature of the act. It's either intrinsically good, it's neutral, or it's evil. The Church has never said capital punishment is intrinsically evil, but neither has it said it is always and everywhere good, because you can bring wrong intention or circumstances to it. So in the circumstances of the early Church, Christians simply did not do that. It was a witness to the world of the message of peace that Christ brought, of turning the other cheek. And they understood that evangelical witness. But what happened? The Roman Empire was overturned, not by violence, but by uh, the example of Christians. And eventually, the Christian state had to ask the question, Could I, can I defend myself against attacking uh, the attacking uh, uh, Islamic forces which arose against the barbarian forces that came uh, came out of Asia, West Asia, into Europe. And in answering that question, the Church concluded that, yes, this right of self-defense still pertained for the nation, and so war could be just, and it fleshed out the theology of a just war. It's also true, then, that capital punishment can be justly applied, and so it began to did capital authorized capital punishment again. So there was a time there in the early days after Constantine when there was very little use of capital punishment, even though the Romans used it a lot. So I think what we have today, and I was just talking with this a little bit with Dave Anders before the show, and that is that the Pope used the expression inadmissible. I take this to mean the same as illicit. 
In other words, something can be wrong because it's intrinsically evil, it can be wrong because the intention is evil, and it can be wrong because the circumstances are evil. I think what the Pope is trying to say, and I think Rome does have to explain itself and not just say it, but in some detail, what the Pope is saying is that today we have no real basis for using this, that it's circumstantially inadmissible, and that there is also this element of the dignity of the person by which we should make that the largest consideration, giving them the opportunity to repent, uh, even though that they're, they're, you know, they would have had that opportunity also in the case of capital punishment. So I think we need a little bit more explanation, but uh, I don't think it's quite what many people are thinking it to be, but we shall see what the church ends up saying. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, uh, we're back, and those numbers again are 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986 if you're in North America, or if you're outside North America, country code 1-205-271-2985. Country code 1-205-271-2985. You can use your smart device and uh, send us a text message at EWTN at this number, 55000. Wait for our response, then give your first name and question. Uh, you can also watch us streaming on EWTN.com. You can watch us on your smartphone uh, uh, apps or on the EWTN apps on smart TVs and on our EWTN Radio Facebook page, where you can also ask questions, as you can on the EWTN YouTube channel. So lots of ways to see us. As our old, uh, our old adage goes, EWTN is everywhere, and that seems to only get to be more and more everywhere, it seems like. Well, let's go to our first caller, and we've got Michael in Greenville, South Carolina, listening on Mediatrix Radio. Good afternoon, Michael. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. My question is, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, when uh, Paul, uh, bef- you know, before he changed, his, he was Saul, mm-hmm. uh, orchestrated the uh, murders of a lot of, of sure. Christians, mm-hmm. and, and may have even involved in, in murder himself, uh, Yet at that time, the church did not have the sacrament of penance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so does that mean that a meritori- meritorious life that Paul lived afterwards would have he would have been forgiven these sins? Well, uh, w- w- uh, penance has been called by the fathers in the church the second baptism. Paul, of course, had the first baptism from Ananias after his seeing Christ on the road to Damascus. And everything is forgiven 
original sin, personal sins, and all the debt and punishment and reparation that is due to personal sin, all of that slate is wiped clean. So upon his conversion, and then his, his uh, of course, the conversion is the first step, uh, but with baptism, he's not only given the Holy Trinity, uh, he is, dwells in Christ, uh, he receives all the moral uh, virtues, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and of course, with the indwelling of the Trinity, sanctifying grace, uh, he gets all of that. So all of that is now passed for him. And this should be consoling to anybody who comes into the faith um, and receives baptism to know that before God we have a clean slate. We have, although we still have the defects that original sin calls, causes in our human nature, in which every day, even among the baptized, we feel the consequences of the three concupiscences, and so we... we we, we struggle. We struggle. We're not like Adam and Eve who are created in grace or like the Blessed Mother who receives it in her Immaculate Conception uh, and starts out with that completely solid foundation of the integration of grace and nature. We re- have a restored situation, grace given back to us, but the nature has already been broken through original sin, and so we are constantly rebuilding, 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 uh, and converting, reconverting rising and falling. The, as it says in Proverbs, the just man falls seven do- times a day and rises seven times because through, uh, through our fallen nature, it's very easy to, to commit even deliberate venial sins, not necessarily mortal sins, but we're certainly inclined toward them. So all that Paul did was basically freed from uh, by him. But, but he did something very good, which I think uh, we don't I mean, we tend to not see, and that is, he tells us that he went into Arabia or into the desert, and he spent three years pondering everything, and no doubt receiving new light from God regarding uh, all the things that he would subsequently teach. So he understood he was a neophyte and that uh, he needed, you know, he didn't go from being uh, a teaching Pharisee to being a teaching Christian. He, he studied the faith, he prayed about the faith, he contemplated the faith, he probably received light from God regarding the faith. Uh, and so uh, that's always a prudent thing. I think sometimes uh, we're too quick to go out and tell others what we think to be true, and, you know, it isn't. Paul did, did this the right way, I think, in my opinion. Does that help you, Michael? Well, thank you. You answered the question. Very yeah, good. sure did. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's go to uh, Ken in Montana, listening on Sirius Channel 130. Good afternoon, Ken. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, the question I had is, I get the opinion that I'm a Eucharistic minister, and when uh, we're not allowed, or there's a proper way to give a blessing, like when a baby is held and comes up, or mm-hmm. an improper way, is I guess I don't understand how or what we should say or do. Um. In fact, you can't give a blessing. Uh, a blessing, you're the, the uh, minister of Holy Communion, who's an extraordinary minister, the, uh, a delegated version of, of what the installed acolyte is in assisting, uh, is not given the faculty of bless. You, you, know, you could go up to any Catholic and they can trace the sign of the cross on your forehead or, or make the sign of the cross over you or lay their hand on your head, and it would be as reasonable and proper uh, as for a Eucharistic minister to do it. Uh, in fact, I have grave issues, uh, and I think the Church does as well, with Eucharistic ministers giving blessings. Uh, there is a document on the on the proper role of the non-ordained minister in uh, w- in regard to the ministry of the ordained minister, and in there from the 1990s, what is proscribed is any action uh, by which uh, an individual suggests that they are exercising the power of ordained office, such as a priest or a deacon should exercise, or a bishop, obviously. Uh, an example of which, which came up with regard to the charismatic renewal in a separate case, was the use of blessed oils in the context of the Mass uh, that were not the, 
were not the combination of a mass with an anointing of the sick, but simply a, a, a use of a blessed oil, as you can use holy water and blessed salt and so on for blessing purposes. In the Mass, because it, it, for lay people to do that, it gives sort of a, a false impression of a sacramental power that it doesn't possess. So the Mass should not include things which are suggestive of the priestly ministry or the ordained ministry, and therefore uh, my understanding is that the, the blessing of people in communion lines um, is proscribed from lay people, certainly, and at one time, the U.S. bishops considered back in the 90s how to even keep priests from do, doing it, and I think they threw up their hands because people have come to be used to that, and it's sort of a tolerated thing today. Uh, so I don't have any particular problem. Anyway, it's not in my job description to, uh, to make those decisions. So it's not, you know, for a priest or a deacon to give the blessing to somebody who comes up with folded arms, uh, my children have, have got, been the beneficiary of that. But there, at least, there's a sacramental power. There's a faculty from the church to bless in the name of the church. The, the Eucharistic minister does not have that faculty. The only one who can give that faculty is the bishop um, and is generally not given to lay people at all and certainly to make any kind of sign that suggests for instance, tracing the sign of the cross after the manner that the priest gives the blessing at the end of Mass. Uh, that would be completely irregular. I would say that tracing the sign of the cross like you would on your children's forehead is certainly less problematic, or simply saying to the person, God bless you, because if you stand there and argue with them, you don't want to get in that, and that's not appropriate in the communion line. So I think it's a difficult problem, and uh, I think it still needs to be solved, but I don't think, you know, swimming with the tide and, and increasing it by suggesting that lay people can give blessings in the communion line is the answer. Uh, I think instructing the parish and getting the, you know, bringing the practice to the end is the answer. Uh, but that's, that's only my pastoral advice, and generally that's probably going to get ignored. So, uh, but we can always say, no, I'm not comfortable in doing that. Uh, I've, I've heard it's not right to do that, that I don't actually have the power to do that. Uh, therefore, you know, I'm not going to do it. And they say, well, you can't be a Eucharistic minister. If it were me, I'd say, okay, that's fine. Does that help? Well, just saying, yeah, so just saying God bless you or just tracing the sign on the cross on their forehead. I wouldn't use my would hands be... because, first of all, you're handling the Eucharist typically with that same hand. Yeah, uh, you know, are you every time somebody comes up, are you going to inspect your finger to make sure there is no particle? I mean, you there, there are other values involved here, including that one. Every particle of the host, uh, you know, Christ is independent of that thing we see, which is a sacramental sign. If we see it, he's there, even if it's in a small particle. So I think that I would certainly not do that because I'd be concerned that I might, you know, be leaving Jesus on their forehead. I mean, no, I would not do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Well, let's go to, uh, let's take a YouTube question. Um, Matt asked the question, the book of Revelation cites the vision of the seven seals along with the Lamb and a figure named Abaddon. Uh, do Catholics, oh, well, I got to dig down and get this Well, I'm not seeing the rest of the question here. Okay, uh, I guess I'm stymied on answering that one. Um, well, let me make a general observation about the Book of Revelation then. The, the do rest you, of the question is, do, you have it? do Catholic okay. theologians hold this as a literal being like St. Michael the Archangel? Okay, and I guess that's a figure named Abaddon. Um I think that's usually understood to be uh, 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 an evil spirit representing. In fact, I think in some apocryphal works, that is a name that is uh, even uh, given uh, to, to, to one of the devils or even uh, to the devil himself. So um, I think that can have a literal meaning. 
historically, it probably is speaking of the continuing battle that since the crucifixion the devil has waged against the children of the woman, as the book of Revelation shows, that that's an ongoing war. Uh, Her son has been snatched up to heaven, but we are here, uh, the mystical body suffering, and uh, in our own day, we seem to be suffering a lot. Uh, So the devil is always going after the church, and I think that's uh, probably the message there, but uh, I've not seen anything specific on that particular scene that would more fully answer um, uh, Matt's question. Let's go to uh, Nora in Belton, Missouri, listening on the Catholic Radio Network. Well, we're going to take a break first. We've got our hard break at the bottom of the hour. Uh, so we're going to take the take some more uh, calls. Please do give us a call. 1-833-288-EWTN. 1-833-288-EWTN. Back in a moment. Okay, uh, we're back, and um, we have callers and uh, YouTube and Facebook questioners waiting online, so let's go to where we were going to go till the music started, uh, to Nora in Belton, Missouri, listening on the Catholic Radio Network. Good afternoon, Nora. Um, hi, Colin. Um, you know what you said, that this crisis shouldn't cause anyone to lose their faith? Mm-hmm. Um, I have a gal that I sponsored in the RCIA that became Catholic and has now said that she is leaving the church because she's so disgusted because of the scandals. But you said something about, you know, evil being a part of the church. And I remember growing up, you know, having some bad formation by some priests that would say, oh, there's no such thing by the devil. That's just the way in Jesus' time that they described people, like with mental illness, they had mm-hmm. demons. But I'm trying to explain to my friend that, yes, there really is a devil, and that same devil is trying to destroy the Catholic Church and has always tried to destroy the Church. So we're in a, a real spiritual battle right now. So can you suggest anything that I can tell her to convince her to not leave the Church, to stay? And, and I know it's a very, very hard uh, right. for people, but any suggestions for me to help her reconsider? Sure, sure. Well— uh... We can we can start with Jesus says Jesus explains how the sheep and the goat will be separated in the last judgment, and that means that the sheep and the goat are co are coexisting in this world. 
Um, one of the reasons we have the, the I remember, oh, about 30, 40 years ago, uh, being uh, in a Bible study with some fellow shipmates uh, in the Navy. You know, and at that time, there was like 10,000 Protestant denominations. And then the number climbed to 30,000. And today, I understand it's 40,000, because many of them don't associate in our traditional denominations, or those denominations have broken up into, you know, liberal, conservative, and then the ones who are following the historical root of that, uh, of that tradition. Uh, and this is, this is what happens when we use a human logic to say, oh, this group of people I'm with are not doctrinally pure. Let's go start another group. Or this group of people that I associate with in this church are not morally pure, or some number of them are. We'll go start another group. We will be the pure. We will be the pure remnant. We will be the ones holding to the, you know, the Bible uh, stronger than all others and have the proper interpretation because the Holy Spirit is leading us. And the result is continual fissure and breaking up into groups. Um, in a sense, you could say this has happened to the Catholic Church in that the Eastern churches went into schism uh, with a good deal of help from the Catholic Church, uh, actually, in the behavior of the papal legates that went to Constantinople in 1054 and so on. So there's a lot of, a lot of blame to go around on that one theologically, discipline-wise, and so on. But we can also say that others have left the church because they wanted to follow their own way, or they thought that the church was wrong, or the church was the whore of Babylon, or whatever whatever excuse was made, usually after the fact, to justify it. And the But the result is the one that I described, and the one that in just the course of 40 years has quadrupled the number of denominations or independent congregations, congregations in Protestantism. Uh, we don't want that to happen to present-day Catholics, and here's why it should not happen. We know Christ established a church, Matthew 28, or in the book of Matthew, it's well established, I think because it was written for Jews, and it was trying to show that there is there's this similarity between what Christ established, the ecclesia, which means an assembly, and the synagogue, which means an assembly, but the ecclesia is the assembly of the redeemed, whereas the synagogue was the assembly of the chosen people called by God from which the Messiah would be taken. And some of those, of course, uh, form also that true shoot which St. Paul talks about in Romans that comes is the church, maintaining all of that in unity until Christ comes again and the Jewish people return to the, uh, to the true stock. But in the meantime, we have to look in the world for where that is. And if our criteria is moral probity, moral purity, we're not going to find it. Because even a baptized person can sin. Even the greatest of the baptized people can sin. Um, you look at the, uh, the lives of the Reformers, I don't find anything there to model in most cases. Uh, broken vows by, the, by uh, Luther and his future wife. Uh, and you go down the list. So there's an aspiration to this kind of purity. That's a good thing, to holiness. But to think we can detach from the human situation and suddenly we're going to be perfect, or that once saved, always saved, and it's not a struggle, and all we got to do is hold tightly onto that, then we're like the man that Jesus criticized because he buried his treasure in the ground and did nothing with it. No, this is a battle of this world that's described in the book of Revelation, it's described in, in the kingdom parables and parables in Matthew, and it shows that this will be continual warfare until the very end. And the Catechism of the Church in paragraph 668 and beyond talks about this. We cannot establish a paradise on this earth, and anybody who says that they can, whether it's communism or whether it's Christians or whomever, it's not going to happen. Christ alone will bring perfection at the end of the world when he returns, and the world is created anew in the new heavens. And until then, it's warfare and struggle until the very end. That's what history is about. Now, with regard to the scandals, you know, you could say this is a new thing. 
I can't think of a historical period when, for instance, you have this confluence of, I would say, both heterosexual moral fault and heter- and homosexual moral fault to the extent that we have today. There's always been concubinage in the church, you know, the priest who has a girlfriend or wife on the side because human nature is weak and those kinds of things get done. Uh, Augustine settled this with the Donatists when he said that the Donatists were saying the minister has to be pure, the sacraments are invalid. And Augustine's answer was no. It's Christ who baptizes, not the minister. The minister is the instrument. So he, the, the, uh, the minister is the instrument of baptism, confirmation, uh, the Eucharist, the penance, uh, anointing of the sick, uh, witnessing the marriage, the, and so on. But it is Christ who is acting in each of these sacraments. That hasn't gone away because the minister is, is morally corrupt. He, if anything, he just reaps new sins on himself for, for celebrating sacraments in that state of moral corruption. Uh, and I, I hope if any of those are listening and they haven't come forward and revealed themselves to the church, uh, that they will do that because you're, you're multiplying your sins by celebrating the sacraments sacrilegiously in, that, uh, in the state of mortal sin. So the fault lies with them. It doesn't lie with Christ who promised to be with the church until the end. Now, it's interesting that St. Thomas makes this whole matter clear when he talks about the nature of scandal. Scandal means a stumbling stone. This was, this was precisely the, the, where we get our root. Uh, you know, Christ will be a stumbling stone to the Jews. It was, was talked about in prophecy, you know, the rise and fall of many of Israel in the, in the prophecy uh, in the presence of Our Lady and St. Joseph and the baby Jesus. Um, so Christ is a scandal. Christ is a scandal because he's holy and he is calling us to holiness and all of that. Unfortunately, the church can be a scandal in the ministers of the church for other reasons, from a lack of, of achieving that holiness. And thank God that people see that lack of holiness, because uh, if, if we didn't see the, the, the truth of that sinfulness, then we would be at fault in thinking that uh, sin and goodness are, can be identical. They aren't. So, it's good that we, we find out these things, but that also we react to them in the proper way. So a scandal can be that which is given, like the priest who is guilty of abuse, or the bishop or other who covers it up, who doesn't punish, who doesn't correct, who doesn't lay aside when that's necessary, you know, who doesn't do those things and then helps get others and promoted through the hierarchy who are themselves guilty— all of that is scandalous when it's revealed, obviously, because it makes people do exactly what your friend is contemplating. Leave the church, identifying the sin of that individual with the church. I would ask her, how about identifying the church with Mother Teresa, with John Paul II, with Padre Pio, with John XXIII, with Teresa of Lisieux? These are the examples of people who live the faith. The holy people, not the sinners. So if we're looking for examples and idols of the church, don't make it into the guy who abuses children and then covers it up. Make it into the saint who lives the life of the faith, who lives the life of hope, the life of charity. Those are the ones we look to, and for those we say, thank God, this is the way I ought to live. As for these others, God will punish them according to their merits. I think that's all we have to do. So Thomas goes on, and uh, that's the act of scandal, what they do that causes others to fall. But then he goes on and asks the question. He asks the question, well, those who fall, are they justified in falling? And his answer is, no, they are not. To take scandal is also wrong. And why is it wrong? Well, it's wrong because we have the promises of Christ regarding the church and the sacraments and its continuity till the very end, the faith, the sacraments, the communion of of the faithful. We have that promise till the very end. And also because what happens when we take scandal is we basically say not only does Christ not keep his promises, okay, but 
it implies that we ourselves are moved from the truth. It says something about us. And here's, here's the quote. It's in his Summa Theologica, in the second part of the second part, question 43, article 5. Second part of the second part, question 43, article 5. And you can find this online uh, by uh, newadvent.org, if nowhere else, newadventoneword.org. Passive scandal, Aquinas says, implies that the mind of the person who takes scandal is unsettled in their own adherence to the good. Now, no man can be unsettled who adheres firmly to something immovable. The elders, that is, the perfect, adhere to God alone, whose goodness is unchangeable. For though they adhere to their superiors, they do so only insofar as these adhere to Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 4.16, Be you followers of me as I am of Christ. Wherefore, however much others may appear to them to conduct themselves ill in word or deed, they themselves do not stray from their own righteousness in accordance with Psalm 124, They that trust in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion. He shall not be moved forever that dwelleth in Jerusalem. Therefore, passive scandal is not to be found in those who adhere to God perfectly by love, according to Psalm 118. Much peace have they that love thy law, and to them there is no stumbling block. Scandalum is the Latin word there uh, in the Latin edition, the Vulgate. So this is the reason not to be scandalous. First of all, we have the absolutely contrary examples of holiness which reflect Christ. And Christ is behind those examples. So are we going to follow Christ? Are we going to follow those examples? Or are we going to say, I'm sufficient unto myself, I'm going to go my own way, without Christ and the Church and the sacraments and the communion of the, uh, communion of the Church, which he himself established and promised would exist to the end of the world. So we shouldn't be taking scandal. We should be, in a way, rightly, justly angry that Ministers of the Church, ministers of Christ who act in persona Christi would do this. We should be angry. But that should not be angry in terms of vengeance, but angry in terms of we need to help purify. We need to help correct. We need to do what is necessary in the Church, in our parish, in our diocese, all according to the proper order of things, of course, prudently, but yet we need to do it for the purification of the church, for the uncovering of, of uh, moral and other kinds of corruption. And that is where our zeal and our anger, just anger against these sins should lead us to do. Not to write off the church, to write off Christ, to write off the sacraments, to write off the unity which we all have as Catholics with Christ and with the hierarchy, many of whom are very holy and good men because we'd be saying to them, sayonara as well, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. So I think there's lots of good arguments uh, to uh, suggest to her that leaving the church, uh, leaving Christ, abandoning the gospel in that way is the wrong move to make. Well, let's go to uh, Wendy in Rapid City, South Dakota, listening on Real Presence Radio. Good afternoon, Wendy. Hello, Wendy. Are you there? Oh, I th Hello. Yeah. What's your question Hello. today? Um, my my question is twofold. Uh, first of all, my family has been helped a great deal uh, with some of my daughter's medical issues by the Shriners, and we're so very thankful for that. But I understand that the church condemns uh, membership in the Masons, and I just wonder if if you could please. Uh, number one, uh, tell me why the church condemns membership in, in the, the Masons and ultimately the Shriners when mm -hmm. the Shriners appear to do so much good work for children. And, and secondly, why there are so many Catholics who are, are, are members of, of the Masons. I, I know very, a, a lot of very faithful Catholics mm -hmm. who are Shriners. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason is long and historical, but in still force today, and that is the Church finds the philosophical and underpinnings of Freemasonry in general, and that would include the Shriners as 
Um, they're independent, but it's only for the highest level, 33rd degree masons, or it is the 33rd degree uh, of that. So you've got to work your way up through uh, masonry to get there, um, to be part of that. And the reason is they consider themselves a universal brotherhood. Whether a Catholic who has been associated with them is willing to admit it, that is, in fact, their their, uh, philosophical underpinnings. Their whole history shows that, uh, that they consider themselves to be the extension of the brotherhood uh, founded uh, in the building of the Temple of Solomon, that in a way they predate Judaism, they predate Catholicism and all forms of Christianity, uh, and therefore are trying to be such a universal brotherhood. They have their religious rites, they have their own uh, funeral uh, services, and, and all of these kinds of things. It's it's a way of life. It's a, it's a ritual way of life. In other words, despite their disclaimers, it is religious. It is religious. It's an alternative religion. And so uh, it used to be under the old code of canon law, you would be excommunicated if you belonged to Freemasonry and you were a Catholic. So in 1983, when the new code uh, was uh, promulgated that replaced the 1917 code, which had that excommunication in it, there were some general statements in there regarding belonging to organizations incompatible with the faith, um, but there wasn't a specific excommunication of Freemasonry and all the organizations that belong to it, uh, that are part of it. And in a consequence of that, some got the idea that uh, they could belong to the Freemasons. And uh, I he- I've heard that in some dioceses, the canonical advice people were even getting, um, not universally, but in some places, was sure what the Church hasn't forbidden, you're free to do. Therefore, the Church doesn't specifically mention Freemasonry in the Code. You can go off and do it. The only trouble with that is there are like 17 or 18 encyclicals of the Post by which it precisely shows the opposition of Freemasonry to uh, the, the logic and the, the specific salvific and unifying mission of Catholicism. And therefore, it does, in that respect, meet what is a gen- general condemnation in the code of the, such or- kinds of organizations. That could be the Communist Party, it could be the Nazi Party, you know, uh, whatever it is. So, to make sure people understood that, Cardinal Ratzinger in 1984, a year after, might have been 85, a year after the code came out, published a document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reiterating that it would be seriously wrong to belong to the Masons, and a person who does so should not receive Holy Communion. In other words, would be in the state of mortal sin and should not receive Holy Communion. Now, we can only be in the state of mortal sin when we know that something is sinful. So a lot of people may not know that it's sinful, but that is what the Church says. Once we know that we should not be a Mason, we should cease being a Mason because the Church is saying it's incompatible with the faith. The Anglicans have said it also, as have the Southern Baptists. Back in the 80s, I think this came up, and the Southern Baptist Convention also said not compatible with Christianity. So that's the reason and the logic of the Church, but we can freely admit that there are people who don't know those things, and therefore they innocently go belong, and non-Catholics who innocently belong, and they're doing good things. That's to be applauded that they're doing good things. And I certainly wouldn't think, and I don't think the Church would be saying that, you know, if if you get your med- medical care at the Shriners, you're not getting it from Shriners. They're not going in there with their funny little hats and their tricycles like you see, you see on the parades and doing surgery. No, you're getting a competent doctor who, yes, fundraising by the Shriners is supporting that hospital. That's all well and good. They're doing a good thing, and that's to be applauded. But I think a Catholic has to look at it with Catholic eyes in terms of actual membership in Freemasonry and the Shriners. Uh, and that's a, different, that's a different question altogether. Uh, so, uh, and, and thank God you're, you, you mentioned uh, family members whose children have gotten great care. Uh, thanks be to God that they have, and I hope that good health uh, uh, continues for them. So. Well, let's go to uh, Steve in Ohio listening on 
1060 uh, a.m. Good afternoon, Steve. Yes. Um, I wanted to know if you could explain to us why Martin Luther dropped various books from the Old Testament and if there is any value to the various books that were present to the early Christians before a specific canon was set out. Uh, sure. Um, that'd probably be a very good call to communion question. Dave could, David could give you the in-detail answer to that one. I will give you what I know, and hopefully accurately here. Um, if you're looking to, if you are as Luther did, you're looking to basically restart Christianity based on the Bible alone, and ignore the tradition of the Church. Obviously, well, this was before Trent, of course, but if you, even you go back before Trent, they're from about uh, the time of uh, 380 and the Synod of Rome, which had been called by Pope Sylvester, there was, uh, at the Synod of Rome, a list of the books of the Bible that includes all of those that are in the Catholic Bible. When Augustine in 390, and I think a second council in 396, a council for North Africa to deal with the Donatists, who actually were dismissing the entire Old Testament, Augustine, that council, the Council of Hippo and then the Council of Carthage, those two councils, local councils, not ecumenical councils like Trent or uh, Vatican I or II, but those two councils issued a list based on the tradition, as it had been for now uh, a thousand years. And it's the books we have in our Bible. When the Protestants question it, uh, the Council of Trent gave that same list, and it's, you know, said, if you do not accept this list, anathema sit. You're condemned. You're out of the church. And so that's the progression of it. So by the year uh, 380 and the Synod of Rome, overseen by the Pope, the, the, there was a certain development in the, in the canon. But if you're looking to ignore everything that happened in that Catholic Church, in quotes, that you now find to be you know, irrelevant to, uh, to religion going forward, then where do you go? You go back to the Jews. So what in Palestine would have been the canon of the first century. So there's an effort to recapture what was the Palestinian canon, and we know because the Jews of, uh, ya, uh, of Galilee held a council in Yamnia in the late first century in which they set out what was to be considered the scripture. They did it because obviously the Christians were now out and about and writing books, uh, they did it because there was a different can can uh, canon in Alexandria that included the books of the Septuagint Bible with the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Both used some of those in, in their Bibles. And they did it because also in Babylon there was a different view on these matters. So Luther went back to a standard that essentially said the Church doesn't exist between the time of Christ and today. And clearly that's not the standard. Standard, The church arrived at the sense of what was scripture over the course of reflection. Uh, but by the second 200s, the fathers were in basic agreement as to what uh, books were in the, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. And those books, if since they're canonical, are definitely worth reading, whether it's the book of Tobit or the, or the uh, various uh, wisdom books that the Church includes, or the story of the Maccabees and their defense of truth in the face of the, of the Greeks of Jerusalem. So go read those, and then come back and ask your questions next week. God bless.